So I'm Descartes. I'm going to talk about uh, the future of, well, I'm going to talk about TX auth, which I think is part of what the future of OAuth is. And so some people may be thinking, is this OAuth 3? Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I'll talk about that at the end of my talk. So um, Descartes, my Twitter handle at Descartes, if you want to follow that. Every once in a while, I tweet something I find interesting in the security and identity space. Um, I was listed as a creator of OAuth. I don't know that I would claim that I'm, well, for sure I know. I'm, I don't think I'm the, the creator of OAuth. There's a lot of people involved. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time for some of the stuff that was going on. Um, if you don't know, there's a talk I did 15 years ago around Identity 2.0 um, that became fairly popular, partly from the topic and partly just from the presentation style. So if you haven't seen that, I think actually a lot of the concepts in that around user-centered identity, unfortunately, a lot of those are still really relevant these days. Um, I helped form the OpenID Foundation, the first version of OpenID. I worked at Microsoft for a while when I was there. I helped create what became OAuth 2 and JSON Web Tokens. Worked at Amazon most recently, worked with NAWS and then Alexa. And right now I'm working on a new venture called signin.org. I was most recently the co-chair of both the SEC event working group and co-chair of the TX Auth Both of, both of which I'm, uh, well, the SEC event working group is finished and then the TX Auth because I'm working on one of the Specs, I've uh, stepped down as a chair so that I don't have a conflict of interest. But I'm pretty familiar with this stuff. So TX auth, sit for transactional authorization. But it was a little confusing to people as to what we meant by transactional, right? Is it, is it authorization for a transaction? Is the authorization itself transactional? So we went through a big process on the mail list and we've uh, renamed it uh, GNAP, which is how I pronounce it. We had some discussion on, was it NAP, GNAP, GNAP? I'm going to go with GNAP for Grant Negotiation Authorization Protocol. Um, before we get into that, let's go a little bit of history on OAuth. Um, we really started off with how do we get access to APIs without people providing their usernames and passwords? And so a lot of that accumulated in a, in a standard called OAuth 1. Um, and then there was a little issue with that. And so there's 10A is what people were encouraged to deploy. Um, and one of the design criteria in that was that they didn't want to have to require HTTPS, um, which meant that it was doing its own crypto. And that own crypto became a real challenge. That's the first issue I've got listed here. Myself, I ran into that one time. I was coding against uh, Twitter, which at the time was still supporting OAuth 1. And I had mistakenly left the S out of the URL, so it was HTTP, but Twitter sometimes would redirect to the right one, but when it would redirect, it would then have an HTTPS, which was a different URL, and it would fail. And sometimes it would actually go through and succeed. And so I had this intermittent bug that sometimes it would fail and sometimes it would work because sometimes the signature matched and sometimes it didn't. Uh, other issues around OAuth 1 were, you know, it was really set up just for web apps and there's a lot of other uh, scenarios. And then we had a real tight coupling between the AS and the uh, protected resource, what we often call the resource server now. Um, which had challenges both in enterprise and in large-scale deployments. So I got together with a few other people, Alan Tom from Yahoo, Brian Eaton from Google, my colleague uh, Jeroen from Microsoft, and I cat herded them to coming up something that eventually became OAuth Wrap, a little fun name history. We thought at first we just called it simple OAuth because we just took out the crypto. It was just like a simple version of OAuth. The OAuth people said, no, 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 you can't use OAuth in your name unless you're building on topping and, and extending OAuth. So I called it Simple Auth, and I forget why, but that was a problematic name. And then I came up with, what about RAP, Web Resource Authorization Protocol? Um, my co-authors all like that. We gave a presentation on RAP at one of the Internet Identity Workshops that was just jam-packed with everybody. And people loved it. And then all the OAuth people started to freak out a bit that we were potentially diverging. And so they wanted us to call it OAuth Wrap. 
And so we did, and um, I presented that spec at the IETF, the, at the OAuth working group. So the IETF had started OAuth working group to do 1.0 work, and then was trying to figure out how to advance that. We presented RAP, and that became the basis for what became OAuth 2. And I don't know if you, you'd have to click into this, but here's all the approved standards now in the OAuth working group. And there's a number of other things still in fly. So lots of work has happened. Lots of standardization has happened around that. Um, and then, of course, there's OpenID Connect, um, all the standards around from OpenID Foundation building on top of OAuth. I think Aaron earlier today talked about OAuth 2.1, which is there's Aaron's nice picture, the picture you want me to have of him. Hi, Aaron. Um, and in that, I stole the slide from him, which was a, uh, you know, all the issues with OAuth 2. So a number of things that are in the standards have been said, don't do that. And there's a number of new best practices and other RFCs. And so it was really confusing to people as to what should they implement. And so 2.1 is really just capturing all of that, and I have the pleasure of uh, working with Aaron and Torsten on authoring that document, which we hope to be accepted by the working group really soon. Um, but there's issues around OAuth too, right? So one of them is the front channel security. Uh, I don't know, I'm seeing an OAuth 2, 2.1 issue slide. Maybe it's just you, Kevin. I like that I can see questions at the same time. Um, so the front channel security, uh, Pixie helps solve that, but it makes it more complicated to implement everything. Uh, you can only send so much data over a URL redirect, you know, and it's all name value pairs. Uh, PAR, the pushed authorization request helps solve that. And then RAR, you know, has sort of a richer format for what the request can be, you know, but you're bolting on something that wasn't designed in. There's a bunch of different endpoints, which has turned out to be um, more of a challenge. Um, you know, you're having to figure out all these different things. And so every time we add a new big chunk of functionality, we um, end up having to create a brand new endpoint because it wasn't really designed as a protocol uh, API endpoint. And then there's the challenges around authenticating dynamic and public clients. You know, public clients don't have a secret. There's a dynamic client registration, but it's not really that well deployed and it's, you know, challenging to implement. And then even for the pre-registered clients or confidential clients, you have shared secrets, which, of course, if you're sharing something, it's not very secret. And, you know, in big deployments, when you have a bunch of different clients, you know, you have lots of challenges around how do you keep those secret. And the other challenge with that is that at the AS, right, it needs, treats a whole AS as a block of trust and that everything in the AS is having to trust whatever verified the secret. And then the last issue is, you know, OAuth was designed for authorization, not authentication, but people started using it for that, which is what drove the creation of OpenID Connect, which was really a standardization of Facebook Connect, um, and it was bolted on, so there's some challenges around that. So um, there's two drafts that might be the starting point of the GNAC work, or we may create a new one. There's the XYZ draft that uh, Justin wrote, and there are some aspects of that that I was at first, partly confused, of which I've aligned on just on some, but there's some other aspects that I think are complicated. So there's a draft I wrote called XOF. So in this talk, I'm going to talk using some of the terms in XOF, um, just as an FYI. So let's go back and review the web server flow in OAuth 2. We've got a client, we've got a resource server, an authorization server, a user. The user is the resource owner of the stuff at the resource, and they would like to let the client access stuff at the resource server. And the user has delegated the authorization server to delegate that authorization to the client. So our flow starts off with the request as a redirect flow over to the AS. All the information about what's being requested is in that redirect. The AS, of course, at this time still doesn't really know who the client is. 
the only strong hint is the redirect URL that's going on, and of course the client ID, but it hasn't verified who the client really is. The AS, of course, goes through, then uh, authenticates the user, gets consent from the user for returning the result, and then sends the code back representing the authorization. And then the client exchanges that code for an access token and a refresh token, and then calls the resource server with uh, that access token. So in GNAP, we have the same actors, um, but instead of doing starting the flow off with a redirect through the user, the client makes a request directly to the AS. It authenticates in that request. That request can be much richer, and it gets back some information. And in this web server flow, the AS says, yeah, I need to interact with the client. And so that request has a bunch of different things. You know, the client can say stuff about it. It can say something about the user it thinks it's interacting with or knows it's interacting with. It says, here's the kind of interactions that I support. Here's the authorizations I would like, and here's the claims I would like. So obviously, some of these are optional depending on what the client is wanting, but we have a place for you know, each type of information about what's happening. So the next thing is that the client redirects the user over to AS, but now instead of that being an API call, it's really more of transferring control from the client over to the AS. And that URI that the client is sending to the AS, the AS minted that on the request. And so it's a request specific URI that the client didn't even know beforehand. Um, the client, the AS does the same thing it did. So from a user experience point of view, it's going to be exactly the same as OAuth today, except that you know, from a protocol point of view, there's no code in there. And the client then goes and makes a call to say, okay, you know, I'd like to get what the user authorized, gets it back, and then the client can make an API call just like it makes an API call today with OAuth. So we've really we've changed the flow and how the client and AS are interacting, but the user experience and the interaction with the resource servers are the same. So let's look at review the OAuth 2 issues and how we've addressed them here. So the first two were around front channel security and the constrained request. Right, starting off in the back channel allows us to have a much richer request. Right away, the AS knows who the client is and what's going to happen. Um, you know, we have a much richer request that we can send over. And of course, we're, our redirect flow now is really just transferring the interaction between the user you know, between the client and the AS and back, you know, there's still some things that need to happen to make sure we don't have a session fixation that the client knows that it's still, it's dealing with the same user that the AS is using and vice versa. The next issue in the OAuth 2 is the multiple endpoints. And so in the GNAP URLs, there's the one endpoint, the grant server URI, which, you know, I'm viewing as a, the GS identifier. Then all the other URIs are dynamic, right? So the interaction URIs, there's a URI the client says, here's where I want you to redirect me back to, which is unique to the request. And similarly, the URI the uh, GS provides is unique to the request. And then in uh, the XAuth protocol, I also have URIs representing the grant and representing the authorization server. Um, and sorry, Kevin. Um, uh, uh, yes, Patrick. I'll just kind of answer some questions on the fly because I can. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more detail later on. Um, so the grant URIs and authorization URIs are very restful. Same with the uh, grant server URI. So you're doing a post to the grant server URI, you get back, uh, you know, essentially. The grant URI, you can do a get on that, a delete on that, a put if you want to modify it. And then uh, you also get authorization URIs for each access. And when you, a refresh is really just another get on that URI. Um, oh, other issues in OAuth 2, you know, authenticating dynamic public clients, shared secrets. In GNAP, the default is to use asymmetric crypto instead of shared secrets. And so each registered client can have its own, you know, 
private key, you know, having a cert from its uh, master that enables the AS to know, oh, I, I can trust this particular instance of a client. You're not having to go and distribute secrets around. And then dy dynamic clients mint their own key pair, call the AS, the AS will return them back a handle that they can use on subsequent calls and know it's the same instance. And then the trust is really on the first use from the user saying, yeah, I trust this particular instance. And then the last issue wasn't designed for auth end, So right away we're baking into uh, the request that the uh, client can ask for claims. So some other new features, um, there's extension points. And so rather than reinventing or saying, here's our schema for claims, here's our schema for asking for authorization, uh, the antenna GNAP is to go and support different schemas. And so as people have different ways of describing claims or requests for authorization, uh, GNAP can just use those. And then we can also support new interaction modes as to how does the client get the user over to the AS and back. And then some additional new features, um, I've written those up in the advanced features draft that I did. Um, one of them is in the core, which is multiple authorizations that you can ask for more than one thing as opposed to just one access to one thing. Um, reciprocal grant, so at times both parties are both a client and a uh, authorization server resource. And so I came across this when I was working on Alexa, where Alexa would want to be able to call Spotify and Spotify would want to be able to call Alexa, both in the same context of the user. Setting that up with OAuth is really complex because you go through one flow and then you need to send the user back to the other side to start the flow. With GNAP, it's, it's really easy to make this happen. Um, GS initiated grants, so sometimes you have the provider, and that's where the user start and wants to go and do something at the client. And so you could just have that happen. That doesn't work very well. It's complicated. You know, essentially you're having to do some other redirects back and forth to make that happen with OAuth and OpenID Connect. And of course, back channel, you can do some discovery. You know, do you have this user, or this is what I think about this user, and depending on what the AS says, if they want to, that's a policy decision the client can decide what kind of experience they want to provide, right? So if the user has an account at the GS, they can provide one experience, and if the user doesn't have an account, they can show, hey, you know, you're going to need to create a new account over there. And those are, you know, two different types of experiences. And then the last one here is, um, you know, sort of future-oriented, but you can see it happening where, you know, if you're authorizing a number of different pieces of information, you may want to have multiple consent screens at the GS for the client. And so the first consent might be something that includes where you live. And then depending on where you live, there may be different things that the client needs to ask for. But since we've started the protocol up with a back channel between the client and the server that as the user answers questions, the GS can send that answer down to the client and the client can say, okay, well, this is what I want next or I'm done and the GS can then prompt the user for whatever's next or send them back to the client. Uh, if you're interested, the mailing list, because once the mailing list is created at IITF, they don't change it, so the mailing list continues to be called TXAuth, and the draft charter, which I think went through IESG approval and is now on, so the last comments is at that URL. So I promised at the end I'd talk about sort of is this OAuth 3. Um, well, it'll obviously be up to the community as to what do we call that, but I think that calling it OAuth 3 is going to be a bit of a misnomer because, you know, it's also got all the functionality of OpenID Connect. And so having it have a, a new name, I think, makes sense. And so I think an app is a good name. And here's a little screenshot from some people finding out how do you say an app, which is, Oh, the Smurfs pronounce GNAP for the purple Smurfs. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, open to other questions. I'll uh, dig into Patrick's question about uh, being able to just go back and forth. Yes, the client can just call the, the GS and get something back right away. 
that was sort of possible in OAuth 2, but there wasn't really any easy way to provide any other parameters about what you're looking for, where in GNAP, you can say, hey, I've got this ID token for this user. Here's all the things I, I want. And the GS can say, oh, okay, I can see you really have worked with that user recently, and I've already got consent for that, and so I'm going to give you these answers. Uh, or I could say, yeah, I'm not even going to give that to you. Um, and the client then doesn't even have to bother uh, providing an interface to the user, right? Where today, right, you're having to send the user over to the AS all the time, even if they're not going to give that. Uh, the IDP implementations, um, Justin wrote an implementation for XYZ, and I'm in the middle of writing up a proof of concept for uh, XAuth. If you go to my GitHub, it's which is, you know, was almost every other idea I have on the internet, Dick Hart, um, you'll see a TXAuth POC repo you can follow that I'll, you know, hopefully within a week be pushing out a node implementation of um, TXAuth. This is kind of fun, these questions. <clears throat> yeah. Um, anything else, uh, folks? Any other questions? Did you have any questions, Ross? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, this was really awesome. Um, yeah, best practice. Another, another uh, request for best practices with GRPC. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Aaron. <laughs> um, how is how is the XY implementation? Um, you know, I I go look at that. Right, some of the areas I disagree are is uh, Justin had a view, and I think you know when you step back philosophically, it, it makes a lot of sense. I have handles for everything, and so we wanted to be consistent that. Everything could have a handle, a handle for the user, a handle for the client, or a handle for the key for the client, a handle for the transaction. Um, I moved towards having a URI, which you know has an identifier in it, but then you know it represents a resource, which enables you to have a much more RESTful interface. And so in his implementation, there's one endpoint, and everything goes to that endpoint, which means you're having to parse JSON to figure out what the client wants to do where if you have different URIs and different methods, your router can actually be decomposed, which in large scale situations, which I worked on at Amazon, you want different kinds of functionality at different services with different teams working on it, which enables you to have you know, a lot more, um, uh, much better security because you're minimizing what each group can do, where you know, a monolith like all OAuth now, OAuth 2, right, you got that one shared secret and everything else has to trust that thing in the front end where in GNAP, if you've got a signed request, you really can just have a router routing it without having to check anything or if it's checking anything, it's just to make sure it's on an error. But the endpoint can go and check to say, you're like, well, who really sent this? And no, it really was that particular client asking for it and then do that work. Excellent. Well, um, thanks, Nick. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. And if there are other questions, folks, um, reach out to Dick. Um, I'm sure he'll be keen to help you on Twitter or somewhere else.